Positive reinforcement is a procedure whereby a student, contingent upon performing a specific behavior, is immediately rewarded to maintain or increase that behavior. We're not suggesting that you bribe students. Most of the time, when we hear the word bribery, we think of people being bought off to do something illegal, corrupt, or unethical. Instead, positive reinforcement increases the chances that a student will do something appropriate that will benefit him in the future. We are suggesting that you use procedures that encourage, support, and empower students to achieve positive outcomes in school and in the community. When Anthony comes to class, the instructor wants him to quickly take his seat and get his materials ready for that day's lesson. If Anthony follows through and is ready to go when the bell rings, the instructor immediately praises him and gives him a token that he can later exchange for a reward. This positive reinforcement increases the likelihood that he'll repeat the behavior again in the future. Positive reinforcement is a very effective way to strengthen and increase desirable behaviors. Now Anthony experiences the same success as his classmates who are motivated to meet teacher expectations. The first step in using positive reinforcement is to select and define a behavior you want to increase. The behavior must be observable and measurable. In other words, student behavior that you can see and measure. For instance, Carla should show more respect is too vague. Instead, when the instructor gives a direction Carla will comply within four to five seconds is a behavior that you can see and count. Likewise, Peter will behave when standing in line for the bus is better stated. Peter will keep his hands and feet to himself while standing in line. After you select and define the behavior, choose reinforcers that appeal to students. There are a wide variety from which to select. Let's begin with edible reinforcers, such as a banana, But watch out, not everyone likes the same thing. It's important to individualize the reinforcers. One way is to provide a menu of edibles, such as cookies, cereal, candy, bananas, pudding, and juice. Start by using the most nutritious food. When using edibles, be sure to check with parents regarding students' food allergies or other medical problems such as diabetes. Also use caution with younger children who may choke on smaller foods such as raisins or grapes. Overall, edible reinforcers are highly effective for students who initially require immediate reinforcement in smaller amounts. Next are sensory reinforcers. These are things you can hear, see, smell, or touch. Here are some examples of sensory reinforcers.
Like all reinforcers, these are most effective when they are individualized and appropriate for the student's age, interest, and ability level. The third type of reinforcer is natural activities or privileges. An easy way to identify natural reinforcers is to watch what students enjoy doing during free time. Or better yet, watch carefully and keep track of what they most often ask to do. Natural reinforcers might include playing a game, watching a movie, reading a comic book, free time with a friend, or shooting baskets. Natural reinforcers are also privileges, everyday things we often take for granted, such as access to school vending machines, handing out calculators, erasing the blackboard, being a team captain, putting up a bulletin board, operating equipment, being an office assistant, Staying up late, or sitting next to a friend. In contrast to natural reinforcers, material reinforcers are usually more effective for students who initially require immediate reinforcement in smaller amounts. Common material reinforcers are stickers, pencils, bookmarks, trading cards, erasers, movie tickets, food coupons, Play. Cassette tapes and CDs. You can find more unique material reinforcers in costume shops and novelty stores. There are also generalized reinforcers. These are any item that can be exchanged for something of value, such as raffle tickets, tokens, chips, points, or credits. Generalized reinforcers are an excellent method to help students delay gratification. Last, but not least, are social reinforcers. Who, me? Social reinforcers are very effective when used alone. Also, they are often paired or used simultaneously when giving other reinforcers. For instance, when Jackie works cooperatively with another student without arguing, the instructor gives her a token while praising her. 
Way to keep working on the teamwork, guys. That's important. Good job. Through pairing, the student gradually becomes motivated by social reinforcers alone, as other forms of reinforcement are faded. Social reinforcers vary, but can be as simple as a smile, a wink, or a nice compliment or praise. Excellent. Very good job. Did you guys hear? You could hear the moving line. I could actually hear the alto part. The harmony was there. I mean, it was very good. Thank you very much, ladies. I can tell you have been working on it. Very good job. But remember, when giving praise, use the I feed V rule. This means praise the student immediately after the target behavior occurs, frequently, and enthusiastically, especially when working on a new behavior. Also, be sure to use eye contact and specifically describe the target behavior. Finally, use a variety of praise statements. As you can see, there are many reinforcers from which to choose. Furthermore, you can enhance reinforcers by using a combination of these in a menu. Better yet, try placing the menu of reinforcers on a spinner. Notice the circle is divided into a number of possible options. The smaller wedges represent the more popular or expensive reinforcers, while the larger wedges are usually less costly and easier to provide. Another great idea is chart moves. Each time Manessa meets a goal, such as completing her math assignment, she gets to connect a dot on her chart. When she reaches a designated dot, she selects an item from the grab bag. Here it is. Let's see what we got in here. Oh, okay. Ooh, got some good things in here this week. As you can see, there are reinforcers for every occasion. But when choosing reinforcers, always follow the golden rule. To keep your sanity and save a dime, choose inexpensive reinforcers that require little time. Now you're ready to deliver positive reinforcement. When teaching new skills or behaviors, make sure the student understands what behavior is required to earn the reward. Then, each time he performs the behavior, immediately reinforce him. Timing is everything. The shorter the delay between the behavior and reinforcer, the greater the chance the behavior will be strengthened or increased. In contrast, the longer the delay between the behavior and the reinforcer, the greater the risk that another behavior will be inadvertently reinforced. Watch this preschool instructor encourage Merlinda to talk by praising her each time she communicates. Shoes, can you say shoes for me, please? Shoes, good talking, shoes. New shoes? New shoes? You see the hearts on your shirt? Yeah, and lots of shapes. Pink? Pink, good talking, Merlinda. Thank you. This is called a continuous schedule of reinforcement. Continuous reinforcement is time-consuming, but necessary when teaching a new skill. Be aware that satiation may occur when a student tires from continuous use of one reinforcer. Instead, use a menu of reinforcers. Then, gradually, as a student masters a skill, reduce the frequency of reinforcers by shifting from a continuous 
to an intermittent or unpredictable schedule. For instance, Kristen has learned to perform her skill independently and consistently. So she is ready to move from a continuous to an intermittent schedule of positive reinforcement. Intermittent schedules maintain the newly learned behavior by keeping the student guessing when the next reinforcement will occur. At first, the instructor intermittently reinforces her on an average of every two to three minutes. Gradually, the instructor moves to an average of every five to seven minutes, and so on, until Kristen experiences a rate of reinforcement typical in her work environment. Remember, use a continuous schedule of positive reinforcement when teaching a new skill. Use an intermittent schedule to strengthen and maintain a behavior. Move from a continuous to an intermittent schedule when the student can successfully perform the new skill. Use student success to guide your decisions. So monitor closely the student's performance. Collect ongoing data of the student's actions. Over time, the desired behavior should increase. If not, check the target behaviors. Are they well defined? And do students and staff understand them? Also, check the reinforcers. Are there too many? Too few? Are they valued? Finally, check that all staff are administering reinforcement consistently. Or do adjustments need to be made? Let's review. Positive reinforcement is a procedure whereby a student, contingent upon performing a specific behavior, is immediately rewarded to maintain or increase that behavior. Start by selecting and defining the behavior to increase. Then choose from a wide variety of reinforcers. Always remember the golden rule. Next, deliver positive reinforcers immediately after the target behavior. Begin with a continuous schedule of reinforcement. Then, gradually, as a student masters a skill, reduce the frequency of reinforcers by shifting from a continuous to an intermittent or unpredictable schedule. Finally, monitor student performance and make adjustments as needed. Differential reinforcement is the reinforcement of one form of behavior and not another, or the reinforcement of a response under one condition but not another. Differential reinforcement uses positive reinforcement to differentiate or separate appropriate student behavior from inappropriate behavior by increasing one while decreasing the other. Contributing to a Peter, class discussion Peter. is appropriate behavior. Peter! 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 But dominating it is not. At first, an instructor may reprimand the student. <laughs> or use some other quick and negative consequence to discourage the problem behavior. 
Instead, differential reinforcement uses positive reinforcement to increase the appropriate behavior, while ignoring and ultimately reducing the problem behavior. There are six strategies that comprise or make up differential reinforcement. Instructors have effectively used these procedures to deal with students' annoying behaviors such as whining, tattling, interrupting, or complaining. However, differential reinforcement is not as effective with students who are non-compliant and tend to resist. In this presentation, we'll focus on these three common differential strategies. First, differential reinforcement of other rates, or zero rates, of behavior. In this case, the instructor ignores the problem behavior while reinforcing any replacement behaviors. For instance, Anthony has trouble staying on task. So when Anthony is off task, the instructor ignores him. But when Anthony is listening to the instructor or students, writing on an assignment, or raising his hand, the instructor praises Anthony. Anthony and Chris, you guys were listening. Give yourself a plus. I appreciate the fact that you were watching up here and not talking out. Looks easy, doesn't it? But it takes practice to consistently reinforce and ignore students' behavior while doing instruction. Let me show you. To ignore misbehavior, break eye contact. Use stony silence. Then move away. In other words, don't pay any attention to the student. But be forewarned. When you first ignore, the student's misbehavior often escalates and becomes worse. So before using DRO, decide whether your class can tolerate the disruptions. If not, consider using another strategy or a combination of strategies. Otherwise, simply remind the student what behavior you're looking for. Trisha, thanks for having your eyes up here and listening. I can tell that you're understanding what's going on because you're watching me. Then, when the student performs the desired behavior, use praise. Boy, Stephanie and Amber, thanks for watching me now and not talking. Give yourselves a plus. Good job. I like to see your eyes up here. To get the most out of your praise, remember to follow the I feed V rules. This means praise the student immediately after the target behavior occurs, frequently, and enthusiastically, especially when working on a new behavior. Also, be sure to use eye contact and specifically describe the target behavior. Finally, use a variety of praise statements. Let's watch this instructor effectively ignore Anthony's misbehavior. To remind Anthony to keep his chair on the floor and to stop tapping his pencil, the instructor uses proximity praise. In other words, she praises students nearby who are demonstrating the correct behavior. Chris, thanks for keeping your chair on the floor. I really appreciate it. Give yourself a plus. From 11 to 11.45, we'll be in Core 4 for science. Trisha, good job keeping your pencil quiet and your feet on the floor. Give yourself a bonus star. I really appreciate that. I can tell that you're listening because your eyes are up here. From 11.45 to 12.15, we'll go to lunch. From 12.15 to 12.45, we'll be playing softball on the tournament teams that you guys have been on all this month. 
And from Quickly, Anthony changes his behavior, and Butler. the instructor Difference immediately praises and reinforces him. Silent reading. Anthony, thank you for having your chair on the floor now. You may give yourself a plus. I appreciate that. Okay, are there any questions about the schedule? As you can see, DRO works best to stop problem behaviors. In contrast, differential reinforcement of low rates, or DRL, encourages students to lower or reduce the number of times a behavior occurs. For example, hand raising is not a problem unless it's done too often. Start by finding out how often the student raises his hand during instruction. Suppose during three days, Andy raises his hand 72 times. That's an average of 24 hand raises each day. This compares to 5 to 8 hand raises for the average student. So begin reducing Andy's hand raises by 1 or 2 per day. Then decrease the number again by 1 or 2. Continue to gradually decrease the number of hand raises per day till the student is performing the behavior at an acceptable level. Let's watch this high school instructor use DRL to decrease problematic behavior. Greg, you can go with them. You had four bonus. Nice job. Troy, you need to finish that assignment before you can go to lunch. Why? You just have to correct those and you can have your lunch. No, I want your lunch. You can when you correct those um, problems there. Well, he did it. Wayne. Notice the instructor uses the stony face approach to ignore the student. Finished? Then when See. Troy behaves appropriately, the instructor marks his card and reinforces him for making a good choice. Good choice, Troy. Be careful. Using DRL can be like losing weight. If expectations are too high, and the goal can't be met. Then frustration and discouragement can set in. But when used correctly, DRL is an excellent strategy for gradually reducing inappropriate behavior over time. In contrast, differential reinforcement of high rates or DRH, works well for behaviors that an instructor wants to gradually increase, such as the time spent pedaling an exercise bike, the number of stakes painted during a 30-minute work period, or the classes that a student arrives to on time each day. Hey, Joey, you're on time too today. Let me sign your calendar. I sure appreciate when you come to class on time every day. In this case, Joey has trouble getting to his classes on time. So the instructor starts the first day by reinforcing Joey for arriving to two classes on time. Gradually, the instructor increases it to three. then four, and so on, until Joey is regularly on time to six out of seven of his classes. Again, 
Use caution. If the increase is too big, or the reinforcer is delayed, or not motivating, Joey will become discouraged and may give up. So give it your best shot. Keep an eye on the student's performance and make ongoing changes to ensure his success. Let's review. Differential reinforcement is the reinforcement of one form of behavior and not another, or the reinforcement of a response under one condition but not another. Use DRO to stop a problematic behavior and increase replacement behaviors. Use DRL to lower or reduce a behavior that's a problem because it occurs too frequently. Finally, use DRH to increase a behavior that occurs too infrequently. Remember, these strategies will only work when praising and ignoring are done consistently and correctly. Yes, it's over, it's recess. I'm out of here. David, be quiet, I wanna get out of here. Kim, thanks for sitting quietly. You can go to recess. Ruth and Sam, ready. you're ready to go. Thanks for being so quiet. Hey, David. Now you're sitting quietly. You can go. A group contingency reinforces an entire group when particular members meet the arranged condition. Group contingencies are commonly used to reduce problematic behaviors. For example, these students are helping Mike to listen and not talk with his neighbors. If Mike is successful, the entire group receives a reward. Group contingencies can also help improve academic performance. For instance, this instructor wants to motivate the class to work cooperatively on assignments. Each day she randomly selects three students. If these students are on task and working well together, then the entire class chooses from a menu of reinforcers. Lately, my Vikings are unmotivated, irresponsible, and uncooperative. What's a conqueror to do? Will a group contingency put starch in their skivvies and stiffen their spine? Absolutely, Thor. Begin by selecting a contingency. There are two basic types, individual and collective. Use an individual group contingency to help a specific student. To improve the skills of a group of students, use a collective contingency. Let's first discuss an individual contingency. In this case, the consequence for the entire group is based on the performance of one individual. For example, Inga has trouble completing her seat work before going to recess. To encourage her, the instructor uses an individual contingency. But beforehand, the instructor makes certain that Inga is capable of doing the required work to avoid any unreasonable peer pressure. 
Oh, you got it done so fast today. Good job. Let me look at these answers and see how many you got right. Oh, that one's right. And that one's right. Oh, wonderful job, Inga. If the instructor discovers that Inga cannot do the work, then another option should be used. Rather than single out Inga, the instructor randomly selects one of the students' names at the beginning of seat work and places it in the envelope. I've got everybody's name in this hat. Derek is going to take a name, but he's not going to peek to see whose name it is. He's going to hand it to me. I'm going to put it in this envelope. And that is the person that has to be working when I check. And if they're working, the whole class will get five minutes extra recess. Now all the students are motivated to perform well, even Inga. In contrast, a collective or all-group contingency is based on the performance of all members in the group. Use a collective contingency to improve social skills or motivation for an entire classroom or crew. For instance, this teacher wants to decrease talking with friends and increase independent seat work. As long as they work independently and stay in their seats, the instructor plays music of their choice. However, if any student disregards these rules, the instructor uses the remote control and pauses the music until students are back on task. I'll use an individual contingency to motivate Sven. Huh? And a collective contingency to encourage cooperation among the crew. Carry on. Next, set a criterion. Begin by identifying a behavior that you can both observe. Hey, har, ho, har, hey, har, ho. And measure. Mm -mm. Such as the amount of time students are on task the percentage of problems completed on math assignments, or the number of times that a student follows directions without arguing. Then record how well the student or group performs the behavior. To illustrate, this instructor is recording the number of problems Lars completes on each day's math assignment. Routinely, Lars completes about half his math assignment. So this instructor sets large criterion at 60% of the assigned math problems the first week, 70% the following week, and 90% the final week. Similarly, if you observe a class that averages 30 talkouts each day, perhaps set the criterion at 15 per day the first week and gradually decrease the number. Yeah, I'll find out how many times per minute the men can pull on their oars. Then I'll know how best to challenge them and increase their strokes. That's right. Now choose the consequences. It's important to let your crew help. Remember, with group contingencies, only positive consequences should be used. If the criterion is not met, then the group simply fails to receive the extra privileges or reward. Also, the reward should be motivating, inexpensive, and easy to provide, such as extra recess time, playing games, or dropping a homework assignment. How about music? Yes, Thor, music is a great motivator. Ah. My seafaring crew often plunder and trade for the spoils of foreign music. The last step is give feedback. Teacher feedback tells students how well they are doing and helps them to measure their progress. Feedback might include marks on the board, marbles in a jar, or color in a section of blocks on a tower each time the group meets its criterion. 
Remember, visibility helps. How's this? That's great. Let's review. Begin by selecting a group contingency. If you're wanting to work with just one student on a problem behavior, an individual contingency works best. To improve behavior or academic motivation for an entire classroom or group, a collective contingency is most useful. Next, set the criterion. This includes identifying an observable and measurable behavior, recording data, and setting the criterion. Then choose consequences. Finally, give feedback so students can monitor their performance. Any questions, Thor? Yeah. What if a few sailors jump ship and sabotage the program for the rest of the crew? Actually, that rarely happens. But if it does, find out whether the crew values the reinforcers. If they do, and the problem continues, set the mutinous sailors adrift. That is, place them on a separate team. Then they'll have to work for their own rewards while the cooperating members work for theirs. But something always seems to run aground when trying a new procedure. No problem. Remember to check the target behaviors. Are they well defined and do students understand them? Check the criterion. Are students experiencing sufficient success? Also, check the consequences. Are they valued? Finally, check the procedures. Are all staff administering the program in a consistent and correct manner? So, Thor, how's your crew doing now? Thanks to group contingencies, it's been smooth sailing all the way. A token economy is a system where students who demonstrate correct behaviors receive tokens that are later exchanged for reinforcers. For example, in this classroom, students receive a paper token when they follow directions, pay attention, or contribute to the discussion. Your good answer. Jared's been thinking. Mr. Baez, give that man a hundred. Then, before going to lunch, students can exchange their tokens for special privileges. A token economy is an excellent way to shape appropriate classroom behaviors. What are you doing, lass? Giving out all sorts of rewards and privileges. Every day the wee lads and lasses will think it's a blooming birthday. Angus, check the valve on your bagpipes. I think it's leaking again. Aye? What are you saying, William? Sorry, lass. So how do we start? Begin by pinpointing academic, social, or classroom behaviors you want to change. Make sure the behaviors are observable and measurable. Then organize and build your token economy around these target behaviors. Start by selecting what type of tokens you want to use. For instance, objects such as play money beans or marbles in a jar, pennies, mm. pennies you say? Yes, or plastic chips are all excellent devices. Watch this teacher motivate her students by giving pennies to those students who are on task at the sound of the beep. Brandon, you're working so hard on your phonics. Dane's color is so nice. 
Use caution when working with younger or disabled students who may swallow or lodge them in their nose or ears. In this case, perhaps happy face stickers, holes punched in cards, or points on the board would better serve these students. Overall, many items work well as tokens as long as they are easily dispensed, difficult to counterfeit, and safe to use. Also, select reinforcers. When the token system is in place, students will periodically exchange their tokens for reinforcers. So the reward must motivate students. You earn sports day. Yeah. Awesome. There are many reinforcers in your classroom that are inexpensive. Pardon me, lass. Did you say inexpensive? That's right, inexpensive, and require little time. Special privileges such as being first in line, Looks like Dynamite Kid has been working hard. He can go be first in line. Free time on a computer or running an office errand are common. Also, notice what activities students like to do during their free time. These can be powerful motivators and should be built into your reinforcement system. All right, lass. Select tokens and reinforcers. What's next? Now comes the tricky part, setting token and reinforcer values. Start by deciding how many tokens a student can earn for doing the correct behavior. For example, this instructor gives one token or a Windsor buck to students who come to class prepared with their calculator, while the paraeducator awards two tokens to students who go directly to their seats and begin working. The flip side of this coin is deciding how many tokens each reinforcer will cost. For instance, this instructor requires students to earn 20 pennies for five minutes of free time but increases the cost of free time to 30 pennies if students want to spend that time with a friend. The secret, as in many economies, is knowing what items are in most demand, then pricing them accordingly. Charging the right price is important. If costs are too low, students will quickly accumulate many reinforcers, thereby losing motivation to perform appropriately over a long period of time. But if prices are too high, students will give up. So allow for a few reinforcers to be earned quickly, while requiring students to save up for the popular or more preferred items. You'll find this adds variety and interest to the program. Next, select a method to keep track of tokens that students earn and spend. Perhaps a classroom bank listing students' names where you can keep a running tally of their tokens. Publicly posting the bank accounts provides feedback and fosters positive competition among class members. But watch out for the wee rogues. To protect your bank records, post the bank in a highly visible location and always keep a backup copy handy. Finally, arrange business hours. In other words, Decide when you will exchange tokens for reinforcers. Perhaps only during lunch hour. Or at the end of each day. Or both. It's your choice, but be consistent. Students will anticipate the chance to exchange their tokens for reinforcers. As a side note, you can use students to manage the token economy. Train students to dispense tokens to others using positive and specific praise. Or give themselves points when directed by the instructor. Anthony, thank you for having your chair on the floor now. You may give yourself a plus. I appreciate that. Now you're ready to use the token economy. First, explain how the token program works. Identify specifically when and where it will be in effect. Some token economies run all day, while others take place during certain class periods. So every day when you come to this class, every morning, 
In the back of the room, you can see the payroll department, and there's a lot of time cards over there. So every day, you'll find your name on one of the time cards, and you'll sign in when you get here and walk in the classroom. So you'll need to look up at the clock and figure out what time it is and put that time down. Then at the end of the school day, before we leave after seventh period, you'll need to come over here, check in, I mean check out and write the date, the time, thank you Randy, the time that you check out of school. Usually it'll be about 2.55, 2.56. Remember to post the rules for earning and exchanging tokens. Role play and demonstrate specific details of the program. Last but not least, it's a good idea to let parents know that you're using a token economy. Be prepared to answer questions that parents might have. A critical component of a token economy is praise. Always use praise when awarding tokens. And Ryan chose a paper and now he has his glue out ready to go. Josh is doing nice handwriting. Describe specifically the behavior that earns the student the reinforcer in a quick and inconspicuous manner. When you first start the program, be sure to give tokens and praise frequently when students demonstrate target behaviors. As students acquire the behaviors, gradually decrease tokens. But while fading the number of tokens, continue praising students when they display correct behaviors. Finally, token economies are complex systems. To maintain student interest and motivation, adjust prices and replace reinforcers as needed. Aye, but some of my lads and lassies need more guidance. It's no right to have everyone achieving the same goal. Good point. One answer is to use a level system with your token economy. A level system? Sure, a level system. A hierarchy of skills and behaviors that students are expected to master. Students begin with fundamental skills, such as keeping hands to self, or staying in seat. When they master these skills, they move to the next levels, gradually improving their classroom, social, and academic behaviors. At the same time, student privileges increase at each new level. For example, this level system helps students in a self-contained classroom return to their regular education environment. Students at the lowest level must first show that they can stay seated keep their hands to themselves, and engage in no physical aggression before advancing to the next level. Here, students master classroom survival skills, such as following directions and paying attention. Also, they must continue to maintain the skills they learned in Level 1. Gradually, they progress to more complex and sophisticated behaviors, such as problem-solving and self-management skills, until they're administering their own points and responsible for their behavior. Remember, throughout this process, student privileges increase as you ask more of the student until all classroom privileges are available as long as they maintain the appropriate behavior. All right. Let me see if I understand all you've said. First, I pinpoint the behaviors I want to change. Then I build me a token economy. This includes selecting tokens and reinforcers, setting their values, making a system to keep track of them, and finally, putting up business hours. Then I'm set and ready to explain the program to the lads and lassies. Now during class, I can start giving tokens and praise, being sure to exchange. And when they're doing real fine, I'll gradually fade the tokens but continue praising as before. And making adjustments as needs be. Oh yes, and be using a level system if my lads and lassies are needing it. Well Angus, what do you think of the token economy now? Aye, it'll work Willie my boy. That's right, remember. A token system is a system of convenience. It simply bridges the time between when a student earns a reward and when he receives it. 
so the reward must be worth waiting for. A behavior contract is a written document between an instructor and student which specifies expected behaviors, positive and negative consequences, and time frame of the contract with review dates. The contract is then signed by the instructor, student, and others who participate in the contract. Contracts are commonly used to improve academic motivation and performance. For example, this instructor is negotiating a contract to encourage David to increase his math scores. If David is successful, he'll earn rewards that he helps select. Nice job, David. Good job. Contracts are also used to improve various problematic behaviors, such as classroom and social behavior, substance abuse, and school attendance. For instance, Mr. Williams is negotiating with Irving to ride the school bus so that he will arrive to class on time. When Irving successfully rides the bus three times and arrives to class before the bell rings, he can choose from a list or menu of rewards that he and Mr. Williams negotiated. Contracts can be a practical and creative way for instructors to help students of all ages resolve troublesome behaviors. The first step in behavior contracts is make Excuse a... Me. Did you say contracts? Well, yes. Perhaps my organization can be of assistance. You see, the putting out of contracts is my business, capiche? Here is a personal copy of my bestseller. Hey, you forget you saw that. You know what to do, right? Ciao. The first step in behavior contracts is make preparations. Begin by defining the behavior you want to change. The behavior must be observable and measurable. In other words, student behavior that you can see and measure. For example, Todd should show more respect is too vague. Instead, Todd will raise his hand and wait to be called on before responding is a behavior that you can see and measure. Likewise, Lucia will try harder to do her math is better stated, Lucia will do 30 math problems each day. But when selecting the behavior, it may be necessary to break it into smaller steps to increase student success rate. So instead of contracting for 30 problems, perhaps begin with 10 problems the first week, then 20 the second week, and finally 30 the third week. Next, my favorite part, selecting reinforcers. During negotiations, the student should identify several rewards that he would like to earn. However, it's best to be prepared with a menu of items that you think the student might like and that you would be willing to offer. The basic rule in choosing reinforcers is that they should be inexpensive and require little time. Too often, instructors feel they must purchase something unique and fail to consider the most powerful reinforcers in their own classroom. Rewards such as being first in line, 
skipping an assignment, sitting next to a friend, being the teacher's assistant, wearing a hat in class, or parking in a reserved space. More extravagant rewards like gift certificates, posters, tickets. What about pizza? Yes, that too can be donated by businesses or individuals outside of your school. If so, use these sparingly or as an additional incentives. Now define the criteria. This is a description of what the student must do in exchange for a reward. There are two basic types, consecutive and cumulative. A consecutive criterion requires a student to perform the behavior a certain number of times in a row, or consecutively, before awarding the reinforcer. For example, Roberta will receive a reward if she earns a C or better on her biology assignments for the next five days. Suppose Roberta performs well the first four days, but gets a D on the fifth day's assignment. In this case, she fails to receive the reward regardless of successfully completing four previous assignments. Instead, a cumulative criterion adds up each success but does not count the failures. Let's try it again using a cumulative criterion. This time, Roberta will receive a reward when she earns five C's or better on her biology assignments. It allows Roberta some leeway if she fails to meet the daily criterion. This cumulative criterion is better because, after all, no one is perfecto. Finally, you may want to include bonus and penalty clauses if the student is not motivated. The primary purpose of a bonus is to encourage the student to meet a criterion in the least amount of time. For instance, Alex's contract states that if he has less than four talkouts during a period, he'll receive a reward. In addition, if he has no talkouts during the class period, he'll get a bonus. But suppose Alex can't resist talking to his friends in fourth hour. At this point, a penalty clause might help. A penalty clause such as changing his seat when he exceeds four talkouts gives him added incentive when all else fails. Now that plans are made, you're ready to meet face to face with the student. Begin by explaining why the contract is necessary. Tommy, recently you've had trouble keeping your hands to yourself. School policy states no smoking on school grounds. Next, lay down the rules for negotiation. Students may negotiate the behavior, the rewards, and the criterion. But one item that is not negotiable is the contract itself. Once the rules have been explained, open negotiations. Share your ideas. Describe the behavior you want to work on with the student. Discuss rewards and criterion. Be sure to ask the student for his input. But watch out. When setting criteria, students often place unrealistically high expectations for themselves. Explain that it's important to start slowly, then gradually increase the requirement. Finally, conclude negotiations and remind the student that the contract is open to renegotiation at any time. After you make the deal, write it down to avoid, uh, how you say it, any misunderstandings. Sign it, then post it. Let's review. There are a myriad of options when it comes to designing an effective contract. You can use them to address academic or behavior problems.
with students of all ages. First, make preparations. Begin by defining the behavior you want to change. Remember, it must be observable and measurable. Next, select reinforcers that are motivating to the student, inexpensive, and require little time. Then, define the criterion. Remember, a cumulative criterion reinforces success and is generally better than a consecutive criterion. Finally, select a bonus clause if the student needs a little nudge. And as a last resort, implement a penalty clause. Now that you're prepared, meet and negotiate with the student. Begin by explaining why the contract is necessary. Next, lay down the rules for negotiation. The student may negotiate the behavior, the rewards, and the criterion, but not the need for a contract. Now, open negotiations. Share your ideas. Be sure to ask the student for his input. If necessary, select bonus and penalty clauses. Finally, conclude negotiations and remind the student that the contract is open to renegotiation at any time. Now it's time to write the terms of the contract. Be specific to avoid later misunderstandings. Sign it. Then post it to enhance its effectiveness. Bravo! Bellissimo! Now talk about the interesting ones where the clients become difficult. If a student refuses to participate, invite a coach, favorite teacher, or parole officer who is important to the student to join in the negotiations. If a student starts out working hard but loses motivation, Check that the rewards occur consistently, frequently, and are meaningful to the student. Likewise, if a student starts out excited but becomes frustrated, check the criterion. It may be set too high. Remember, the student must first experience success before he'll have ownership in the contract. Guido? Any more words of advice? Like I always said, if you want to snuff out misbehavior, put out a contract and tell them Guido sent you.